Here we're gonna look at a problem from the 1968 International Mathematical Olympiad. So this is question six. Our goal is to find a nice closed form for this expression involving the floor function for any positive integer n. So we've got the floor of n plus one over two plus the floor of n plus two over four plus all the way up to the floor of n plus two to the i over two to the i plus one and then we keep going. In other words, we've got this sum as i goes from one to infinity of the floor of n plus two to the i over two to the i plus one. Okay, so just like normal, before we look at a solution, I wanna give you guys some hints so you can try it out on your own. So I've got three hints here. The first is to s explore a few small cases to make a guess. So what I mean is like the n equals one, two, three, four cases. And what you'll see is it's pretty easy to make a guess in this case. Then the next thing, which is maybe not a big hint because it's kind of obvious from this setup is you'll probably want to use induction. And then finally, another thing that's not a really big hint because it's kind of obvious from this setup and that is this is really a finite sum. And that's because the denominator is outstripping the numerator in terms of growth, which means eventually whatever's inside of this floor will be less than one but that means that eventually this floor will always be zero. And so that's gonna truncate this sum at some um, finite number. Okay, so give the go problem a go with these hints and we'll come back with a full solution. Okay, so hopefully you tried the problem with those hints and now we're gonna look at the solution. And our solution is gonna start with, an, with some exploration so that we can guess the formula for this closed form and then we'll prove that guess. So let's look at the n equals one case. So in the n equals one case, we have the floor of one plus one over two plus the floor of one plus two over four plus dot, dot, dot. But it's pretty easy to see that this term right here is one. It's the floor of one, so that's just one. But now we have the floor of three quarters, but that's gonna be zero. And then everything past this is actually gonna be smaller than this inside of the floor. So that's gonna be zero as well. So all of this stuff cancels out to zero. And then this term right here is equal to one. And so that means that the whole sum is equal to one. So let's see what we get for the n equals two case. So we'll have the floor of two plus one over two plus the floor of two plus two over four plus the floor of two plus four over eight plus dot, dot, dot. Great. And now just like before, here we have the floor of three over two, so that's the floor of one and a half, so that's gonna give us the number one. Again, this is the floor of one, which is one, and now we're at the point where we're taking the floor of a number that is strictly less than one, which that's gonna give us zero. So in the end, we have one plus one, which is two. Okay, so let's look at another example real quick. So here we have n equals three, that'll be the floor of three plus one over two, plus the floor of three plus two over four, plus the floor of three plus four over eight, plus dot, dot, dot. Great, so now we've got three plus one, which is four over two, so that's gonna be two. Then we have three plus two, which is five over four. We take the floor of that, that's gonna give us one. And now we're at the point where we have like seven over eight, the floor of that is zero, and so on and so forth forever. So in the end, we have two plus one, which is equal to three. Great. Now I'll let you guys check this one. I won't work out, but you can see that the calculation is not too difficult. And what you'll end up with is four. And then for n equals five, you'll end up with five. For n equals six, you'll end up with six. So that gives us a nice claim that we can make and then prove which will solve this problem. And that is the closed form of this sum is n. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and clean up the board and then state that claim and prove it. So on the last board, we did some exploration of our problem and we came up with this claim which will solve the problem. And that is the sum as i goes from one to infinity of the floor of n plus two to the i over two to the i plus one is equal to n. And that's true for all natural numbers n. So we'll do this proof by induction. And so our base case, which will be the n equals one case. Notice that's done on the last board, so I won't even worry about that. 
So now let's go ahead and make our induction hypothesis. So in other words, we want to suppose for n equals k, we have this sum as i goes from 0 to infinity of k plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 equals k. And then consider the next term. So let's go ahead and write that down and consider. But I don't exactly want to consider the next term. I want to consider the next term minus k. And if I can show that the next term minus k is equal to 1, then that means the next term is equal to k plus 1. So in other words, what I want to look at is this sum as i goes from 0 to infinity of the floor of k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 minus k, where this k is happening outside of the sum. But now I'll use my induction hypothesis to replace k with this sum up here and then combine those together into a single sum. So notice by our induction hypothesis, so let's maybe point that out. Induction hypothesis tells us that this is equal to the sum i goes from 0 to infinity of the quantity, the floor of k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i. Um, minus the floor of k plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i. Great. Now what's left is maybe to explore this term right here for different values of k and i. And I think um, I'll leave it to you guys to explore that term with different values of k and i, but what you'll find out very, very quickly is that this term is equal to 1 exactly one time and equal to 0 um, everywhere else. And so that means if we prove that that is true, then we're done. Because if the terms of this sum are equal to 1 only once and 0 everywhere else, then that means that this term is just the sum of a bunch of zeros and a single one, which makes this term right here minus k equal to one, which makes this term right here equal to k plus one, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so I'll move that kind of stuff up and then we'll continue on. So on the last board, we got our problem down to the following point. So we made an induction hypothesis, and then we showed that the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of the floor of k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1. In other words, the k plus first case was equal to k plus this sum as i goes from 0 to infinity of the floor of this same thing minus the floor of the previous case. And so what that means is that we are left to show that this extra bit, in other words, this sum as i goes from 0 to infinity of this difference of floor type objects is equal to 1. And what we'll do is prove that by claiming that there is a unique non-negative integer that makes that 1, and at all other places that is equal to 0. So let's go ahead and prove this subclaim, which will finish this off because that will collapse this infinite sum here to a single term, which would be the i not term, which will be just one. Okay, so let's see how this proof will go. Well, first we'll have to show that we can find one of those. So we'll do that by noticing that this object is equal to one if and only if this term right here is a natural number, this term inside of the floor. Because if this term inside of the floor is a natural number, it's the smallest such number that has that certain floor. And this guy, which is right underneath, has a floor that is one less. So let's just reiterate what I said. So we'll have the floor of k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 minus the floor of k plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 equals 1 if and only if this thing inside of the floor is a whole number. So we've got k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 is a natural number. Great. But now notice that that is equivalent to saying that 2 to the i plus 1 divides 
k plus 1 plus 2 to the i. Great. But notice that that means that k plus 1 must be divisible by 2 to the i. So I'll write that down and then we'll talk through it. So this means that 2 to the i divides k plus 1, but 2 to the i plus 1 does not divide k plus 1. So let's talk our way through that. So if 2 to the i divides k plus 1, well, then that means that this guy right here is a multiple of 2 to the i, but that, when, that means when we add another 2 to the i on there, we'll get a multiple of 2 to the i plus 1. So we're good. But now if 2 to the i plus 1 divided k plus 1, then that would mean that 2 to the i plus 1 was a multiple of 2 to the i, which is clearly not true. Okay, good. So we have this kind of setup right here. But now what we want to notice is that this kind of thing happens exactly one time. So let's write that down. So happens exactly one time. So I'll let you guys think through how to show that this is possible at all. But the kind of idea here is for any natural number, including k plus 1, you can pull all of the evenness out of it. And that's what this 2 to the i is. This is all of the evenness of k plus 1. So in other words, we've divided 2 to the i out of k plus 1, and we're left with an odd number. And you can do that um, via the fundamental theorem of arithmetic for any number. So now what we want to show is that this is unique. So let's go ahead and do that. In other words, show that it's unique. So let's suppose that 2 to the i divides k plus 1. 2 to the i plus 1 does not divide k plus 1. And 2 to the j divides k plus 1, where 2 to the j plus 1 does not divide k plus 1. So in other words, we've got two um, possibilities that satisfy this condition. But what this tells us is that k plus 1 can be written as 2 to the i times a, and it can be written as 2 to the j times b. And since 2 to the i plus 1 and 2 to the j plus 1 does not divide k plus 1, that tells us that a and b are both odd. Great. But we can also, without loss of generality, assume that i is less than or equal to j. So obviously we want to show that i is equal to j, but without loss of generality we can assume that it's less than or equal to j. But now what we'll do is take this equation right here, 2 to the i times a equals 2 to the j times b, and rewrite it a little bit so that we have a equals 2 to the j minus i times b. Great. But now notice that the left-hand side is odd, which means the right-hand side is odd. But the right-hand side is odd only when j minus i equals 0. In other words, i equals j, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So we just got done proving that there was exactly one point i naught in z bigger than or equal to zero, in other words, non-negative integers, such that this floor term minus this floor term was equal to one. And I want to point out that from the proof, we saw that that i naught was defined in a way so that two to the i naught divided k plus one, but two to the i naught plus one does not divide k plus one. So now our next subclaim is that for all other values of i, this thing is actually equal to z. Now we'll split the proof of the subclaim into two cases. So the first case is that i is strictly less than i naught. So look, we know that 2 to the i naught divides k plus 1, um, but that means that 2 to the i will also divide k plus 1. And furthermore, when we divide k plus 1 by 2 to the i, the quotient will be an even number given the fact that a larger power of 2 divides k plus 1. So in other words, here we can write k plus 1 as 2 to the i times a, where a is an even number. So let's just keep that in mind. Now we're going to go ahead and plug this into this term right here. So in other words, we've got the floor of k plus 1 plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1 equals, we're going to replace k plus 1 with 2 to the i times a, then we have plus another 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1. Great. 
But now notice we can factor a two to the i out of the numerator and cancel it with the denominator. And we have a plus one over two. Good. But now given the fact that a is even, we say that a plus one is odd, which means the floor of a plus one over two is just the same thing as the floor of a over two. But the floor of a over two is really just a over two because again, a is even, but we're not gonna write that down. But now notice that this is going to be the same thing as the floor of a over two. Notice a over two is a natural number. But now as long as we add something less than one, then we still have the same floor. And so we'll do that, but the number that is less than one that we'll add is one half minus one over two to the i plus one. So that's most definitely less than one. And it's bigger than zero. Okay, great. So now what we'll see is that if we reconstruct this thing that's inside the floor to the right, we'll get exactly k plus 2 to the i over 2 to the i plus 1. But now looking at this extreme left and right hand side of this equation, we see that those two terms are equal, which means their difference is zero, which means we've proved this subclaim two in this case when i is less than i naught. And then the other case when i is bigger than i naught will follow similarly, but I'll leave that for you guys to check. Okay, so now we've got our subclaim one, our subclaim two. I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up and we'll finish it off. So now we're ready to finish it off. So using subclaim one and subclaim two, what we'll do is take i naught, which is a non-negative integer, such that two to the i naught divides k plus one, but two to the i naught plus one does not divide k plus one. So this is always possible. We're just kind of like dividing all of the evenness out of k plus one. But now we can use this second subclaim to break this down into k plus. Now we have the floor of k plus one plus two to the i naught over two to the i naught plus one minus the floor of k plus two to the i naught over two to the i naught plus one. So that's using the fact that all other values of i give you zero. But then by subclaim one, that value will give us one for that difference, which makes this whole thing equal to k plus one, which finishes our inductive argument and finishes the proof of this claim. And that's a good place to stop.